Hi, and thank you for tuning in to episode 10 of Together Spartanburg. My name is Peter Kay, and I'm the composer in residence for the Spartanburg Philharmonic. Today we're going to talk a little bit about a collaboration that we did with Ballet Spartanburg last year uh, to create Apollo and Daphne, uh, a new take on that story, so to speak. So some of you know that Ballet Spartanburg and Spartanburg Philharmonic are in the same building at the Chapman Cultural Center. They're downstairs, we're upstairs, uh, which means that we run into each other in the hallway sometimes. And one day, Carlos and I were, were in the hallway chatting, and he asked what kind of music I write and what my style is and whatnot, and he asked if he could get a CD of some of my work. So, so I burned one for him and shared it with him. Uh, a few months later, um, and, I, and I remember this very clearly because I was in a meeting with Stefan Sanders, so this was January, maybe January 2019. We were talking about the 2019-2020 season, and Stefan had just talked to me about the details of Phoenix Cathedral, the piece that I wrote for, for them in October of that year. And while we were having this conversation, uh, Carlos po popped his head in the door and said, Hey Peter, I really like that CD that you shared with me. Let's write a ballet. Let's do it this month. So it took a little bit longer than that, but it was a very, very short timeline uh, putting that whole thing together. For me, it's very exciting to work with other artists from other disciplines, uh, musicians, composers, visual artists in particular, actors, poets, writers. It always makes me think outside of the box and it, I get ideas that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Uh, last year's project was really interesting because uh, we were working with two of the Hubbub artists in residence from last year, Amber and Ling and Marisa Addisman, and they had this idea of using the tale of Daphne and Apollo. The performance, The Tale of Apollo and Daphne, came out of the Hubbub artists in residence desire in their collaboration with Ballet Spartanburg during the Women's Month to revisit a classic tale of failed romance between a man and a woman, in this case, a god and a nymph, and kind of give it a twist, a updated view on female agency, romance, love, tragedy, violence. So the story goes that Apollo mocks Eros. Eros is Cupid, as we call him today. And Cupid, to get revenge, fires two arrows, one gold and one lead. The gold one goes into Apollo. And he immediately is absolutely and passionately in love with Daphne. And Daphne is shot with the lead arrow, which makes her hate Apollo. So it's this unrequited love story. Daphne doesn't want to do anything with Apollo, and she asks her father if he would save her from the pursuits of Apollo. And Pinos turns her into a tree to escape Apollo, turns her into a laurel tree. A heavy numbness sizes her limbs. Her soft breasts are surrounded by a thin bark. Her hair changes into foliage. Her arms change into branches. Her foot, just now swift, now clings to sluggish roots. She turned into a laurel tree. Well, Apollo loves her anyway and does not want to let her go, so he turns the laurel tree into an evergreen so that it'll last forever. And that's where the story ends in ancient Greek mythology, essentially. So when creating a ballet from scratch, uh, sometimes it is a story that has been written by someone else. Uh, and I usually try to read as many versions of the story and then I go about writing a uh, libretto like a script you know of how the story develops. So Carlos and I met to discuss the details in this ballet the musical details in this ballet and, and he gave me five scenes he said there's gonna be an introduction where we meet all the players the men and the women um, Apollo and Daphne. The second scene is going to be the scene in which Cupid fires those two arrows. The third scene, Daphne becomes a tree. Um, the fourth scene is the transformation of that tree. And then the fifth scene is Apollo alone. Uh, things developed and changed after that, but that was the original outline that he gave me. Once I have that mapped out, scene by scene, what the intent is, what the emotional weight of the scene is, 
I go about finding music. The music to me, since I already know the emotional content of the scene, what I want to develop, uh, when I hear, and I hear many, many pieces of music, um, I immediately know, oh, that's that scene where this is happening. That's the scene where she dies. So that's the scene where they fall in love, or that's the scene where the revenge takes place. I had some ideas, some motifs, some themes of music that I kind of liked that I thought embodied the essence or the feeling of that particular scene, and I shared those with Peter. We talked about the music that he really wanted to use. Um, he gave me a temp track. A temp track is very similar, I mean, they have that sort of thing in uh, movies. It uh, sets the mood. It's some pre-existing music by which editors and, and whoever else and the, the actors can get a sense of what that scene is about with music. And so he, he gave me some music by Max Richter and Philip Glass and said this is kind of the energy, the tempo that I'm looking for, uh, this is the mood. And then Peter, of course, uh, already has some idea of, of my intentions with his particular movement or scene. And then he went about composing uh, things uh, that I felt, or he felt, were in line with my motivation for that particular movement or scene. Um, my music doesn't really sound so much like Max Richter and Philip Glass, although there are some similarities in the repeated patterns, the simple harmonic language, that sort of thing. So that's what I started with, and I started writing music, um, and gave him little snippets. And, and he would say, I like where this is going, I don't like where this is going, this, you know, let's change the tempo a little bit. When we got near the end of the, the whole process, which was probably two weeks long, it was a very, very fast turnaround. Um, when we got to near the end of the process, and I sent him tracks, uh, and then he would take it uh, and listen to it and, and figure out some of the choreography and then they would rehearse a little bit of it and then he would send it back to me and say, hey, this is 20 seconds too long, or this is five seconds too short, can you write a little bit more, can you trim this? Uh, so the, the original version of some of these pieces is quite different uh, and I, I do like some of the music that ended up on the cutting room floor, but that's, that's part of what uh, scoring a film is about, part of writing a ballet or anything. It's a collaboration and sometimes you write something or you create something that that the other people can't use or doesn't quite fit the storyline. And so you just, you cut it. Once the music is there to go in line to develop the script or the libretto, uh, it, the next question is, uh, where does it take place? Uh, what is the look? What is the habitat for the ballet or the piece, whatever is something more contemporary, like uh, Daphne and Apollo? Costumes are really important. And Amberina and Marisa had some excellent ideas about what the clothing should be uh, and how it changed. In the beginning, you know, the, they were more carefree. Uh, and then as the ballet evolves, obviously there is a transformation scene in which Daphne turns into a tree. So that was very tricky to try to achieve that. It's really important because if you give the dancers or the characters in the ballet a different clothing, it totally changes in many ways the meaning of the movement and the meaning of the story or the, or the intention that we wanted to bring across. So the classical myth has a god spurned by a woman and um, her transformation into a tree, a kind of tragic outcome for all parties. And as we were designing costumes and sets, we wanted to capture some of the fantastical nature of this myth, but also think about women as becoming part of nature and this incredibly primeval, powerful thing, upending the original um, conclusion of the tale and allowing audiences to challenge themselves and their understanding of how myths like this have influenced media, whether that's cinema or theater or sculpture, any kind of creative arts. So the introduction starts off with the two groups of men and women on the, on the stage and they're, they're frolicking, I think is actually the term he used. I wanted to give an upbeat sort of sound to it. I wanted it positive. 
I wanted it to set up the idea that this is a, sort of a sad story in the long run. It's bittersweet, it's happy at the beginning, sad at the end, and there are a couple of things that I focused on for that. But the melody is, is fairly simple and it's, and it's a major. And that's that first melody. Now, what I wanted to focus on there were this, this dichotomy of two ideas. You have this happy major sound, and then also a little bit of a minor sound in there. Most people would find it too much of a clash to have the two chords playing at the same time. Major and minor. So I wanted to have that back and forth between the two, this play of the lead arrow and the gold arrow. We have this clash of two things that don't go together, this unrequited love, he wants her, she doesn't want him. That's the basis of most of this piece, this ambiguous between two major and minor modes. So in the second scene, that's just Apollo and Daphne dancing together, and it seems that they are in love at that point. But then Cupid sneaks onto the stage and fires his arrows. So they're dancing in the center of the stage, and I've got music in the middle of the piano for that. But then Cupid sneaks in, and I've got this sneaky little melody for him. But he's also surrounding them, and to make it just a little bit creepier, I added an octave, a few octaves. So Cupid fires his two arrows. Apollo is in love. Daphne hates him. They're fighting. The music is all minor mode now. And she's kicking, physically kicking him away. And that's where that scene ends. Like she flees. She gets away. She runs off to become a tree. And in the third scene, he is alone, pining after her. So the third scene is a solo, where he's worshipping this tree and missing her so much. So then we get to the fourth scene, the transformation of Daphne, where she turns from a laurel tree into an evergreen and something even greater than that, more lasting. So when Carlos and I first started to work on this, we had maybe six weeks, maybe a month to pull everything together, which means there's not a lot of time to write the music, edit the music, to work with the choreography, then give it to musicians who then record it and get it back. So. My plan setting out was to write most of it for piano. And actually it's overdub piano, two pianos. But I also added in some synth, some electronics, some of my computer. And in the transformation, I took that quite literally to transform this instrument into the pipe organ. So another keyed instrument, but I added the sound of an organ as this grand change for, for Daphne. 
Uh, and then the organ is there at the last uh, movement as well, but for the most part it's, it's featured only in that fourth movement. It does mean that it's not something that could be played live necessarily, not without a synth um, or a very big setup, but uh, it's, it felt like that was what was needed in this particular scene. So after the transformation of Daphne into this evergreen, into something everlasting, we have the closing scene, the fifth scene, which is a reflection, an echo of the opening. The men and the women come back out on stage, the movements are the same, but the light is dimmer, the, it's slower, the music is, is sadder. It's, it's an echo. And eventually all the men are gone and it's just Apollo by himself with the women. And, and there are so many questions that I wanted to make the music have a question as well. And I'm playing major and minor chords, just like I was at the beginning, against each other, but I'm focusing on the one note difference. And by that I mean this. Here is a B major, B flat major chord. And then here is a D minor chord. There's only one pitch difference between the two of them. And so I'm playing those back and forth, back and forth. So it's both chords at the same time in a sense. And I trail off at the end with that because I want it to be a question. Who is the hero of this story? What have we learned from this story? Is it a positive outcome? Is it a negative outcome? Daphne escapes, but at what cost? So that's the way I wanted the, the story to end, with a question mark more than a definitive resolution. Well, you'll get to see it tomorrow morning. Please tune in at 10 a.m. tomorrow on any of our social media channels to watch Apollo and Daphne performed by Ballet Spartanburg.